Hi, my name is EJ Massa. I forgot my my lab mic today, so I'm going to be using this little this microphone here. I hope it's not a problem. It's a distracting. That's in the frame. That's in the. <laughs> anyway, we're in the middle of peak television right now, and what that means, I don't know, but everyone says it. They say this is prestige television, peak television, all these p p uh, television is all these things. I tend to agree with them. I mean, uh, we there is so much. And so much of it is at least decent. I mean, 20 years ago, even the most like middling show now would be like rave reviews right now. So we have so much to choose from. So much of it is is good. So it's like, how how do you pick? And the three shows I want to talk about right now are Fargo, uh, The Leftovers, and Better Call Saul. So first, I want to start with Fargo. Um, I loved season two. Just, maybe just get this a little closer. I thought it was like the most perfect season of television that you could do. I thought it was a masterpiece. I loved the cinematography, the lighting, the characters, the pacing, just everything. I I like season one as well. I thought it was good, but it had a few a few problems with pacing and maybe uh, I don't know. It just didn't it didn't really click with me the way season two did. Maybe it's like the '70s theme of season two. Uh, the main the main character was really strong. The crime was very interesting. Uh, the Peggy and Ed story was was uh, out of this world great. Uh, such a good chemistry between those two characters. Such a good uh, relationship, and it uh, paid off very well. And now we're at season three, and I watched the first two episodes, and I liked it, sort of. I mean, there's something about it, and I think it's because it looks like they pulled out the blues or something in the show, so it looks very drab, and I don't know if that's something to do with it, and it's like my psyche, like we just got out of winter here in New England, and I don't really want to see like gray, uh, blah stuff anymore. But that's doing. That's not doing something for me. Uh, Ewan McGregor uh, plays two roles, plays two brothers, and it feels a little gimmicky to me. I don't know. I'm thinking back to season two here. I'm thinking back to, you know, the Gerhardt brothers and how they're, you know, very different, very strong characters. Um, and maybe it wouldn't be as good if they were played by the same people. But um, just these two episodes. Um, I don't really see much of a need for Ewan McGregor to be playing these two roles. It feels like a gimmick. Is uh, I don't know, maybe it's his voice too. His voice sounds too similar from each one. His accent's not that great. I like Ewan McGregor too. I like I love Big Fish. It's one of my favorite movies uh, as Big Fish. And so I like Ewan McGregor's performance. I think he did fine as Obi-Wan Kenobi for what the prequels were. I don't know, maybe it's just it just doesn't feel like it's clicking with me yet. And we have plenty of time. I, I could be, I could warm up to it. Could warm up to it. Maybe there's a reason why they cast him in, in two roles. And he, um, and it's also very distracting. Every time that he, the two brothers that are played by Una McGregor are in the same room, it's very distracting. I mean, because especially the one of the brothers has like, you know, like one of the bad makeup jobs in the Americans. It looks like that. I wonder if I didn't know Ewan McGregor, and I didn't know that, would I be able to tell? Probably. I probably would. I'm also deep in the pulse of media, so who I can't really say. If I wasn't the person I am now, would I enjoy anything? Just, just think about that one. There's like an a interesting theme of like technology this season. Uh, like technology being, um, you know, kind of a threat to like Midwestern values. You see technology, uh, like Carrie Coon's character, uh, automatic doors don't open for her, and people are doing Google searches, and and some bad things happen, and um, and, uh, and it's kind of funny. Uh, Carrie, I'm going to talk about the leftovers. Carrie Coon is having technology pro problems in the leftovers as well, so it's fun. Uh, I like. Carrie Coon. It's it's kind of a treat that she's in two series that I love. I haven't seen enough of her in Fargo this season to make a say that her performance is strong yet, but so far so good. Mary Elizabeth Weinstead as a kind of like the Peggy-ish character, uh, Nikki, is phenomenal. I love seeing her, and not because she's beautiful, but maybe maybe because she's beautiful, but also because um, you know it's just a very fun, compelling character. It's like if Peggy from season two was already self-actualized and still kind of crazy. I, I even like uh, Mary Elizabeth Weinstead and. Uh, Ewan McGregor's Ray, they're uh, 
their dynamic is it's still kind of fun. Again, it kind of reminds me of Peggy and Ed, but in a different way. And I don't know if that's a problem. I don't know if like all these things that are familiar but are different. I want I don't know if that's bad or not. But it's just a thing. It's a thing that you have to you have to deal with with um, Fargo. It's it's this see we'll see if it works as the as the as this third season goes on but i don't have the best impression of it so far um what i do love is uh the uh, what's his name let me see david thulis uh, one thing i one thing i do love is david thulis as um vm varga i think he's like creepy he's sleazy he um he has this like pained and deliberate way of talking and i think that is um it's just super fun and he seems super sinister and um it's a, just a unique character so i'm i'm excited to see him as a villain especially when he's manipulating emmett stussy um i can see that being really really fun so 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 far i'm a little lukewarm on fargo i think the goodwill of season two will make me keep watching season three until the end um and we'll we'll see we'll see if ewan mcgregor pulls it off and noah hawley shows me he's a genius once again and that the casting decision uh, of ewan mcgregor maybe will pay off maybe it'll pay off I wonder if because he uh, Noah Hawley made Legion and this kind of so close together, maybe the quality of one of them suffered. But like again, it's too early to tell. I'm not gonna pass judgment this early on. Yeah. Now we're on season three of The Leftovers, the final season of The Leftovers. I um, again, it's kind of like Fargo. Like season one of The Leftovers, I was. I thought it had interesting ideas. I like the concept of people disappearing without any um, explanation and how we as a society would deal with it. I thought that was an interesting concept and all the cults and all the repercussions of that that came about. I thought that was interesting and maybe it didn't like stick the landing, but it was an interesting enough for me to check out season two. And I'm so glad I did because season two, it's just, it was it was just great. Maybe it was just the 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 concentrated setting in 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 Jarden, a miracle or whatever it's called. And the Kevin Garvey character, I can just watch him just mope around and smoke cigarettes and be like have that have the pain si- sine wave uh, eyebrows. I could watch him do that forever. They did an interesting thing with him, with him seeing that Patty character. It's, it's an interesting show. It's, it's It's got the cloud of grief over it, but it resembles kind of reality in a way. How how do you move on? How does humanity move on from gr- uh, uh, huge uh, disastrous incidents that you know you can't explain? And reality itself you can't really explain. You're, you're going against a reality that you can't fully explain, you'll never be able to explain. And The Leftovers kind of captures that sadness, but also the quirkiness of it, the, um, uh, the absurdity of it, the humor of it. And of course season two had that awesome karaoke scene which everyone talks about and it is great. I, uh, I, I did cry, no I didn't cry. I didn't, I swear. And this third season is, I think it's starting off pretty strong. It's like in season two, uh, you know, Kevin, you know, did some miraculous things. And now people are like, or at least uh, Matt, the reverend is like, hey, maybe you're, you might be Jesus and I'm writing a book about you. And I think that's a, that's an interesting way to do it in the absurdity of, of there being like a, a Messiah-like figure, but he's just a normal guy. <laughs> he's a normal guy, but all the supernatural stuff's happening to him. And, um, and then you have Carrie Coon, who I think is, um, is just a revelation. The, her acting is on another level. She's still dealing with the initial loss of losing her kids and her husband uh, to the event. But um, even at the end of season two, there was a catharsis where, you know, you've, they've all come together as a family, but, you know, still things move on from there. And you still you have that uh, that sadness, that tragedy. And how do you as a person move on from tragedy? Do you take up religion? Do you do magical thinking and, and self-help stuff? Do you just go mad? Do you just deal, you just don't deal with it and you go mad? Um, I don't know. There's something about it. It's 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 a bizarre show, and I I've always have a hard time recommending it to people because I like it a lot, but it's a lot of emotional stuff that uh, 
that it brings to the table and the, the comedy and the bizarre imagery. And sometimes it doesn't feel like it goes anywhere, but um, I still really enjoy it. So it's hard for me to recommend it, but you got good acting, the cinematography's good, and it all comes together with like a superb soundtrack. Like, just phenomenal soundtrack. And that might be most of the reason why I like it. I find it endlessly compelling and relatable, even in the face of all of its obtuseness. And then we have Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul. So you got Bob Odenkirk. He's pulling in a rock star performance against, uh, uh, what was his name? Michael McKean. Especially, uh, he has a confrontation at the end of episode two, which is like really, really heartbreaking. But also like, you're like, no, 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 Jimmy, stop, stop. It's a, it's such a different animal than Breaking Bad. And maybe that's disappointing to a lot of people. And, and it, to some extent, it was disappointing to me. It's a slower show. It's not as plot focused as Breaking Bad was. I mean, we're in season three. Just think about where we were in season three of Breaking Bad compared to where we are now. It doesn't seem like a lot has progressed. I mean, he's still not Saul Goodman yet. And th there's a little bit of uh, anxiety and tension about that because you you know his fate. You know he's going to turn to this character of Saul Goodman. And you're just waiting for that moment for Saul Goodman to appear. But it's still good. I think Michael McKean is a great villain. He's like, as Jimmy's brother, he he's like morally in the right uh, most of the time, but he does it in such a way that um, is like, he's like morally and legally in the right, but he does it, he like does it in such a way that's so like self-serving and selfish that you can't help but hate him. Um, especially how he brings Jimmy down because you see he's jealous of how easy things come to Jimmy and how that's not right and how everyone immediately loves him and he works so hard to be this pious, lawful person and he just comes off as off-putting and I think that's a great dynamic, the two brothers there um, and their like struggle. I, I find that really compelling. And then you have Jonathan Banks as Mike and he's basically the second main character and half the show is devoted for him. I mean... It can get kind of ridiculous because sometimes the episodes feel like it's just, it's Mike looking through binoculars uh, for minutes at a time. But um, it is I like I like seeing how methodical he is. He's a little bit of like a Mary Sue kind of character where he can basically do anything, but he's still relatable. He 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 still can get people can still get the jump on him as a. a Gus's team did. I love seeing him turn his gears and figure out how to um, approach, solve problems and approach things. And and I could really just watch my, a whole series of, of Mike just uh, solving problems and, and wandering through the desert and looking through binoculars and figuring out what his plan is and maybe him figuring out his enemies. It's it, I don't know. I like it. I'm enjoying all the accelerated Breaking Bad Easter eggs. You have Francesca coming back, and I like seeing her pre- uh, Breaking Bad area. She's not broken in by Saul Goodman yet. She's sunny and chipper, and I can't wait to see that transformation. Um, you have, of course, the return of Gus uh, from Breaking Bad. Ah, oh, man. And just hit the interaction between him and Mike uh, is very great. This show is made by masters. The cinematography is is awesome. I mean, you got this. Sh the, you got this shot with the guy eating the chips and it's like and you're just watching it and you're just enthralled by by this character and this shot this he seems like a real person you have a, you have this, um this shot at the end of episode three with uh with kim against the and and jimmy against the it's just beautiful look at that look at this shot these motherfuckers look at this shot okay you might say that doesn't sound seem like that much but look at jonathan banks he's straddling the line while gus is is like over the line it's it's what, 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 see these motherfuckers, see these motherfuckers. Again, it's a, it's a different show from Breaking Bad. You can even see that in the way everything is shot. It's all locked down on tripods. Um, very few handheld shots. While uh, Breaking Bad plays a lot in handheld shots. Um, so there's less immediacy to everything. It's a lot slower. It's a lot more character driven. I kind of hope that in the future we see uh, more of the, like when Jimmy becomes Gene. Um, I, I really liked the beginning scenes in black and white of each season where we see Gene, but I kind of want to see more. I want more. It only shows that these guys 
they make things that I just want to watch. Uh, Vince Gilligan, Pierre Gould, they just they make they make the things I want to watch, and I just want more of it. You know, maybe a lot of the frustration is is just week to week it's a little too slow. And I mean, I don't think that because I'm a very patient person, but I can see why people think it. I can see it, but I don't think it. I love this show. That's why I think about those three things. And there's so much more TV out there. Um, coming up, we have American Gods, which is a Neil Gaiman adaptation on stars. I'm looking forward to that because that's Brian Fuller, who uh, uh, was the showrunner in Hannibal. He was the showrunner on Pushing Daisies, two of my favorite shows. Hannibal especially is really good. And then you also have um, Preacher coming up soon. And I really liked the first season of Preacher. A lot of people didn't like it. Um, it didn't really follow the comics. It was kind of like a prequel to the comics. Um, but I hear people who watched it week to week, Preacher season one, week to week, didn't like it very much, but I binged it and I really enjoyed it as a, you know, 10 hour piece of fiction. I don't know. So I think some things maybe are, you know, more suited to the binge format, or I think you, you just don't, you're more forgiving when you watch things in a binge format. It, you just are, you have the next episode immediate so you, you forget all your disappointments with the previous episode um so i really enjoyed season one of preacher and i think that uh i'm looking forward to the road trip aspect it seems really fun um of the second season they're going on a road trip the characters so uh i i, th I think that'll be good anyway so that's why i think about television lots of television television for days you've come a long way since the sopranos and lost um and we have too much. We have too much.